Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so we will have three talks in this session. Um, the first talk is by Alexandro Vaketa. Um, he will be talking about the status of Quark TMDs. Please Thank start. You. Thank you. Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here in, the very, in this very nice atmosphere. I know that many of you attended the school uh, last week, so I will uh, skip some of the uh, details uh, on the interest of uh, going to some uh, new results. But nevertheless, let me start with some introductory uh, slides. Maybe not needed for this audience, but still uh, quickly, uh, let me re-mention again these uh, uh, documents that have been produced. Uh, this is the most recent one, the 2023 Long Range Plan. And and in uh, all these documents, it has been uh, emphasized over and over again that uh, EAC is uh, going to be built and it's a, uh, one of the uh, top priorities for the uh, inside the long range plan. And uh, what is the connection between EAC and uh, what I'm going to talk about? Well, one of the main goals of uh, uh, EAC, clearly stated in all the documents, is that uh, it will be a powerful discovery machine and a precision microscope capable of taking three-dimensional pictures of the nuclei and, nu and uh, uh, nucleons, right? So my um, um, focus will be on this uh, three-dimensional imaging of uh, uh, nucleon uh, structure. I will focus on uh, quark TMDs because then uh, Christian will uh, speak about uh, gluon TMDs. So uh, when we speak about uh, TMDs and uh, three-dimensional structure, why are we talking about uh, uh, three-dimensional structures? Because uh, as you know, uh, most of the studies conducted so far have focused on the one-dimensional structure of uh, the nucleon, meaning that we study the distribution of partons inside the nucleus as a function of the longitudinal fractional momentum, so basically one variable. Then there is, of course, also the scale dependence. So with energy scale, this thing uh, change, but this is, uh, can be predicted on the basis of uh, uh, PQCD. While uh, when we go uh, to uh, 3D, so when we assume that we are also able to observe the distribution as a function of the transit momentum, then there are three dimensions, the longitudinal uh, direction and the two transit uh, direction. So, these uh, three-dimensional uh, maps in momentum space are encoded in uh, what we call uh, TMDs, transverse momentum uh, distribution. So our task is uh, and using the data already available now, but certainly with uh, the addition of uh, EIC data study, these uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, maps. Uh, what are the questions that one can answer uh, using this uh, uh, if we have access to these TMDs. There are pretty obvious and fundamental questions like uh, how wide is this distribution of partons in KT? So what is the uh, kind of average transfer momentum that partons have? But then that's the, not the only question. The other question is what happens if we change X? So is this uh, width uh, staying the same at different axes? Is it becoming larger or narrower? And then there is also the question, is there a difference between flavors? Are, do up quarks have more transit momentum on average than down quarks, for instance? And uh, eventually also, what happens if we include spin? Does the distribution get distorted by the inclusion of the presence of spin or not? These are all questions that are, we just started answering. And as you will see, we don't really have a clear answer to all of these questions. And the EAC will help us immensely to answer uh, them. TMDs are a, pre, a, a huge subject by uh, now. When I, when I started my, my PhD, uh, not even the acronym TMD existed. So uh, at that time, very few people were, uh, paying attention to these uh, uh, structures, but now it has become a mainstream uh, subject. And uh, if you want to have some uh, feeling of the 
the state of the art, there's this uh, very nice uh, review uh, by the TMD collaboration called the TMD Handbook. This is 471 pages. So uh, clearly one cannot uh, condense uh, the state of the art in, uh, in a single talk and not even in two talks if you include gluons. But I will, if, if you want details, you can look there. So uh, TMDs, there can be many TMDs, and I'm sure you have discussed this in the uh, school last week. And in particular, if you focus at the leading twist level, there are eight uh, TMDs, which depend on the polarization of the nucleon and on the quark inside uh, the nucleon. Now, just to give you a very uh, short uh, uh, idea of the situation, let's also name a couple of them. This uh, the F1 T perp is the Sievers function, and H1 is the transversity uh, function. Now, what's the status in a few words? We have a, a good or very good uh, knowledge of the eggs dependence of F1 and G1, of the unpolarized and elicity distribution, X dependence as Christine also discussed uh, this morning. We have some pretty good knowledge by now of the KT independence of the TMD uh, uh, F1, so the unpolarized. We have a fair knowledge, maybe I can define it, fair knowledge of the sievers and of the transversity, transverse momentum distribution. And uh, we have some hints about the others. Okay, so, this is the general situation with the leading twist uh, TMDs. The interpretation of this uh, uh, distribution is uh, pretty well known. So again, I will not emphasize this too much. It has to do with the probability of finding the quark with a certain polarization inside a hadron with a certain polarization. The three F1, G1, G1 and H1 functions, they can be defined as TMDs, so with transfer momentum dependence but they also survive if you integrate over transfer momentum. So they have also the, a collinear PDF counterpart and the others are really genuinely only TMDs. And uh, this is for the naming systems I will, uh, I will use. Uh, now, this is a slide with some uh, references of uh, recent extraction of uh, uh, quark TMDs. Now, it is not really complete in the sense that, first of all, I try to put only the most recent extractions, avoiding sightings. So there are dozens of uh, uh, older articles, but this is, these are, say, the state of the art. And I'm not going to discuss all of them, but at least you have here a, an idea of uh, uh, where to look for uh, information. These are leading twist uh, TMDs, but of course there are also, uh, sorry, and I did not mention here in this slide, and I will not mention during the talk, uh, some other prominent topics which have to do with TMDs, namely pion TMDs. So I will talk about proton TMDs, but you can do studies also of pion uh, TMDs, and there have been uh, extractions of pion TMDs recently. I won't talk very much about TMD fragmentation functions. I will focus more mainly on TMD parton distribution functions. And I will not mention the topic of nuclear TMDs. All of these topics have been addressed also from the uh, phenomenological point of view in the last years. Uh, then there is also the entire spectrum of subleading twist TMDs. So if you go to subleading twists, which are uh, related to observables, which are one over Q suppressed compared to the uh, leading twist one, there is this plethora of uh, uh, TMDs. And here there has been uh, lots of progress in the last years from the theory side, trying to understand their properties of evolution and of factorization, which is more involved as you can imagine compared to the leading twist ones. There is some knowledge of the GT uh, X dependence, just because this is related to the structure function G2, which has been uh, measured in the past in uh, inclusive DIS. And uh, uh, basically we don't know uh, much about the others. Maybe there's, we can also argue that there, is, there are some first hints of the, about the E of X, this function E, uh, the X dependence of this function E, which enters in unpolarized observables. All others are basically unknown. 
is our sublinear twist, uh, TMDs. So let's now focus on what we know best. So leading twist, unpolarized TMDs. Here I have a few slides because we can really do some uh, discussion of uh, the precision, the choices, and the, and the differences between extractions. So most of the talk will be about the unpolarized TMDs. Where do we measure an, uh, unpolarized TMDs? One uh, um, typical process is uh, Drell-Yan. So proton-proton uh, collisions, for instance, producing vector bosons. Uh, photons or uh, Z. And in order to access the TMD information, you have to measure the transfer momentum of the outgoing uh, uh, vector boson, so of the outgoing lepton-antilepton pair. If you do not measure that, if you integrate over that, you have no access to TMDs. Now, if you have uh, the information about the transfer momentum, then you have a structure function of the, the Drellian process, which is FUU1, which is QT dependent. And it is written as a convolution of two TMDs. A TMD coming from the first proton, a TMD coming from the second proton, and they are convoluted in uh, terms of momentum. So there is no direct access to the TMD, but only to the convolution of them. Now, usually you treat this convolution in a, complex, in a, in a PT conjugate space, what we call BT space uh, most often, because this convolution becomes then a product in BT space and it's easy, easier to deal uh, with it. This is um, uh, Drellian. And notice here also that I write the TMD as, as dependent on X, the longitudinal uh, momentum, BT, the, the Fourier conjugate to k perp, and a scale mu similar to the collinear PDFs. Now, normally, I mean, uh, in general, TMDs depend on two uh, scales, but uh, for convenience, I set them uh, to be equal. The, then, uh, if you have only Drellian, you have, uh, of course, some limitations on the possibilities to study uh, TMDs. As for PDFs, if you used only Drellian data, you would be limited. But we can also use semi-inclusive DAS as a process to study TMDs. In that case, you need to measure the transfer momentum of one of the outgoing hadrons, and only in that case you have access to TMDs. Again, the uh, observable, in this case the structure function uh, FT, can be written as a convolution of two TMDs. One is a TMD part on distribution function, the other is a TMD fragmentation function. Again, you can go to BT space and write this as a, a product of two uh, functions. Now, the structure of the TMD, especially when you go to BT space. So you, we are talking about the Fourier transform of the original uh, TMD. This can be written, schematically speaking, as a combination of ser several terms. Uh, there, is, there are some terms which can be calculated perturbatively, so basically they can be predicted on the basis of PQCD, and some which are non-perturbative and come from the uh, data. And the, the calculation uh, involves the, um, the use of a scale mu b, which is inversely proportional to uh, bt, 1 over uh, bt. I'm mentioning this because, for instance, in this first part, you have something which involves the collinear PDFs uh, convoluted with some matching coefficients. So this can be calculated perturbatively. This is a non-perturbative object, but can be extracted from uh, uh, collinear PDF uh, fits. So in our studies, at least uh, up to now, we give this as known. So we are taking the collinear PDFs from other uh, fits. All of this has to be uh, co uh, computed at the scale mu b, which is inversely proportional to uh, bt. Which means that when you go to uh, very high uh, bt, this scale becomes lower and lower. And at some point, you, have, you enter a non-perturbative region, which is impossible to calculate. That's why you need to sort of, uh, a, you need a prescription to avoid this uh, uh, going into the non-perturbative uh, side. And this can be done in many ways. Be, most of them uh, involve the modification of the uh, scale at which you do this computation. Then, apart from this part, we have a part which is, uh, again, uh, uh, can be calculated perturbatively. It's called the perturbative pseudoconform factor and has to do with the 
emission of several uh, gluons. So multiple gluon emission. In the low uh, KT uh, region, this is peculiar because this is where you can resum them and build this nice uh, uh, exponential uh, form. And then there is what we call the collins soper kernel, which contains a perturbative part, which is basically part of the similar calculation as before, but there is also a non-perturbative part, which has to do with the fact that you cannot push the calculation to very high values of BT. Finally, yeah, and th this modification of mu B involves the, an introduction of a B star prescription, which uh, uh, sort of freezes BT, and uh, BT cannot become too big. At some point it freezes, so you freeze the lower limit of uh, the scale. And uh, in our case, we also use, uh, maybe I will, have, uh, I will have the chance to talk about it, but maybe not, we also use a prescription to freeze the uh, lowest limit of BT, which uh, com, uh, translates into a highest uh, value for mu B. In any case, once you introduce this prescription and you freeze the value of BT, then not all of this TMD can be calculated perturbatively. So you need to introduce also a non-perturbative part of the TMD. This is the object you have to extract from uh, data because you cannot uh, compute it from uh, first principles, unless, as you will see, you use lattice QCD. So this is a table showing you uh, the three most complete extractions of uh, unpolarized TMDs. They are complete in the sense that they use all available data in, from uh, semi enclosed DIS to uh, Drellian. In Drellian, you have a fixed target data, so relatively low Q, but also uh, collided data, including LHC uh, data. And uh, the number of points here, then for, for, uh, for instance, this one, the MAP22 extraction, is of the order of 2000. And uh, as you see, these uh, extractions can uh, achieve a very good description of the data, meaning that the formalism seems to be on a, uh, in, a, in a good uh, shape, in good shape. So it, what kind of uh, coverage do you have with this uh, data set in terms of X and Q square? Here you see the, the regions covered by the experiments. And we, what we have is here, down here, is uh, uh, semi-inclusive DAS. Semi inclusive DAS at the moment is only, uh, we, at the moment for TMD physics, we have only fixed target data, so pretty low uh, Q square. Then um, here there is the fixed target Drellian uh, data dating back to the 80s. And up here there is collider uh, Drellian data, including Tevatron and also LHC. Uh, and uh, here there is this space is also taken by uh, Rick, by uh, Phoenix in this case. So there is a limitation in going into this uh, uh, region. Uh, this is uh, overlaid with the current status of data points used for collinear PDF extractions. So you see that for collinear PDF, there is a much wider range in Q uh, square. So we, the, the hope is to go in that direction and cover better the, the space, but at the moment, this is what we have. This is a similar coverage plot by the other main uh, collaboration doing uh, these extractions. So this is a table which is there just for the purpose of giving you an idea of how well we describe the data. And you see that we do describe uh, well all kind of data. So same includes DAS, and Relian. Relian fixed target, maybe not such a beautiful uh, chi square. And uh, see this very good chi square. Maybe the problems come from uh, Drellian Collider uh, data because there are in the data sets we are considering, there are some data sets that we, at the moment, we are not able to describe very well. Mainly, these are Atlas uh, data. Atlas data uh, have uh, very small errors, and uh, in, in spite of all our efforts at the moment, we were not able to achieve a good chi-square. But if you remove Atlas data, the description is uh, uh, very good. What do you get out of this? You get these TMDs, so this uh, distribution of quarks in uh, eggs and uh, uh, k-perp. So here you see different values of eggs, 
and the shape in transverse momentum. In this case, since everything is unpolarized, there is only a dependence on the modulus of k perp, so only on one extra dimension, not on two uh, dimensions. And you see already something which is uh, non-trivial. Non uh, and also, by the way, you can also do this at uh, different scales, 2 GV, 10 GV. Most of this, uh, the, of the difference between 2 GV and 10 GV can predict it mm, perturbatively. But part of it is also encapsulated in this uh, non-perturbative part of the Collins Hopper uh, kernel. So there is part of the uh, difference which has to be uh, fitted. Anyway, here you see that there are uh, some non-trivial uh, features like uh, maybe uh, some eggs. Uh, so compare, for instance, the uh, 10 to the minus three to the 10 to the minus two, uh, sorry, to the 10 to the minus one case. You see that the normalization is almost uh, the same, but uh, the distribution here seems to be wider. So in this sense, we are starting answering one of the questions I posed at the beginning. We have some information about how the width of the TND changes with X. This is a uh, plot of the transverse momentum independent fragmentation functions because in semi to use semi included DAS, as we were also mentioning uh, this, uh, this morning, you have also to deal with fragmentation functions and with TMD fragmentation functions. So we have to extract simultaneously the TMD PDF and the TMD fragmentation function. And this plot shows you the shape of the TMD fragmentation function we extracted. Now, I want to just draw your attention on something which we, you probably notice immediately. So the, the, the peculiarity of this shape, which has some uh, uh, double uh, bump. Now, our, uh, uh, our opinion on this uh, situation is that at the moment, we can describe that we need this kind of shape to describe data. This is coming from the fact that we have inside our functional form, basically the sum of a Gaussian and a weighted Gaussian. So we create, we, the, the, our functional form is free to create two bumps and data seem to indicate that we need two bumps. However, we don't know if this is the end of the story in the sense that we do not have separate data for uh, TMD fragmentation function studies. We, needed, we need E plus and minus data with TMDs and they are not available yet. Uh, nevertheless, maybe this uh, will go away. I don't know, maybe it will stay, maybe it is physics in the sense that maybe there are two different channels in the production of, uh, uh, in this case, pions uh, coming from uh, U-quarks and they behave differently. Maybe, for instance, they go through some resonance. So the, the pion come from maybe a spin one resonance. And then this decay can, uh, can um, generate a specific signature, which is maybe this uh, second bump. So we think that this possibility should not be uh, ruled out and should be included not only because they are needed to describe the data at the moment, but because maybe there is physics behind it. So this is a different shape, definitely different from a simple uh, Gaussian. What about flavor dependence? There are not so many studies about flavor dependence. We did some exploratory studies back in 2013, so more than ter uh, 10 years ago. And at that time, we concluded that there was room for uh, flavor dependence, so we could not, we couldn't say, okay, they have to be the same, but we could also not clearly say they have to be different. There was room for flavor dependence. And uh, uh, nowadays we are uh, starting doing uh, extractions which take into account also the flavor dependence of TMD. For instance, this is the most recent extraction of uh, TMDs on the market, it's called ART23. Uh, uh, by uh, the group of people collaborating with uh, Shimemi and Vladimirov. And uh, this uh, extraction has a couple of peculiarities. It reaches the so-called N4 LL accuracy, which is the highest available, but uh, it, uh, it uses only Drellian data, which we think it is quite a strong limitation 
uh, also because, as, uh, as you will see, one of the outcomes is that they find different shapes for the up and down uh, quirks. So this is uh, the beginning of some signals that we need flavor uh, dependence to describe uh, data correctly, which is, I would say, not unexpected. There are differences in the PDF, so there are differences also in the TMDs, but it is difficult to uh, pin them down, as you can imagine. Uh, so this is a, uh, also a very recent uh, paper that came out and discusses the choice of fun functional form and, the, uh, and uh, several um, details in the implementation of the extraction. And uh, uh, these plots show the TMD multiplied by KT square. So because of this extra factor, the tails of the TMDs are strongly enhanced. Maybe too much to enhance because here they are really very small in absolute value. The, the transfer momentum, uh, the TMD is very small. If you multiply by KT square, of course you enhance it. And what you see is that uh, the shape from uh, our extraction in this case, but one of the uh, latest extraction is uh, highly uh, non-trivial. And if you assume a more, more simple, a simpler model, you can get something smooth. But the point is, you do not, at least as far as we know, you do not describe the data with these simple uh, shapes. So this, uh, uh, the paper here is, uh, I think, uh, interesting because it emphasizes the relevance of uh, prescription choices, uh, choices of functional forms. Uh, the influence of collinear uh, PDS on TNDs. These are well-known uh, problems, but this article re-emphasizes them. From another point of view, this article is not a uh, extraction of TMDs, so one has to confront the ideas with uh, uh, data. Asmita. This is just the uh, result of using the perturbative uh, uh, matching part. So the collinear PDFs convoluted with the matching coefficients and uh, extrapolated to low uh, KT, which uh, at some point uh, diverges. Okay, so some other uh, details and, and uh, work in progress and uh, expected uh, um, uh, new steps uh, concerning the extraction of unpolarized TMDs. Here um, in our extraction uh, in our latest extraction we use a certain uh, pdf set which was at the time mmh mmht 2014 which is a hessian set so it's not a, a set a monte carlo set with, with replicas now we decided to uh, now switch to a, a set with uh, monte carlo replicas and uh, this is what happens in the final uh, tmds the uh, new fit has a higher uh, error band because it contains not only the errors due to the shape of the TMD, so to the parameters of the uh, TMD function, but also the errors due to the collinear PDF choice because for each value, each replica, we have a set of uh, non perturbative sets. So clearly the error band is uh, bigger if you take into account also the error on the collinear PDF. And uh, uh, so this is certainly a better uh, measurement of the uncertainties related to TMDs. However, notice that the shape, the functional form does not change dramatically. So we don't need to invent a new functional form when we change the uh, PDF. We just need to retune the uh, parameters of the uh, non perturbative part. Also, something else we are thinking about and we think it is very important is at the moment from the fragmentation side, we take the same TMD for everything, all the flavors and especially all the final state haters. But we have data for, for pions and we have data for kaons. So one uh, step which is necessary is to make a distinction between pion TMD fragmentation functions and kaon TMD fragmentation function, which has, was not done yet. And here you have a, a feed. These are prelim, preliminary results, but I show you what can happen. So these are the two TMD for pions and kaons, normalized to the same uh, value. Otherwise, the, the kaon uh, uh, one of the two would be uh, much smaller. The kaon one would be smaller. But not only, but apart from the normalization, you see that the shape is different. 
So our conclusion is that you need a different TMD for different final state agents, and this is still to be investigated. So lessons learned so far concerning uh, TMDs, uh, extraction and unpolarized TMDs. I would say that these statements are pretty uh, strong. First, a single Gaussian or a bell-shaped uh, uh, distribution as si simple like that is not sufficient to describe the data uh, we have. The TMD shape must be X-dependent. You cannot achieve a good description if you do not in introduce an X-dependence. The fragmentation functions are probably, the TMD part, I mean, are probably different for different uh, final state hadrons. And TMDs are probably different for different uh, core flavors. These are probably because we have to still to finalize the extractions. And of course, we need to do more sophisticated ones. Now, uh, what can we also compare or what can we use these uh, results for? We can do comparison with uh, lattice QCD, for instance. This uh, is a comparison between our extracts, the, the phenomenological extractions of what I call the non perturbative part of the Collins superkernel with uh, lattice prediction. And you see that uh, uh, there are many uh, different groups doing this calculation and also many different phenomenological extractions. And TMD phenomenology are the curves, and lattice QCD are the uh, points. And this is also a similar plot with another recent uh, study of this kind. Uh, we can also be brave and try to compare uh, the extractions with even uh, lattice calculation of the TMD itself, not of the Collins super kernel, but of the TMD. These are exploratory studies, pioneering studies based on this idea of quasi PDF, pseudo PDFs. So you see that the agreement is definitely not so, uh, not, not great, but uh, we would say that it's already encouraging to see them on the same uh, plot, okay, on, with the same uh, scale. So uh, things are uh, progressing uh, fast uh, from both the phenomenology side and the lattice QCD side. Then what about the impact of these studies on other uh, fields or other topics, mainly uh, related to LHC physics? One is the determination of the W mass. What have uh, TMDs to do with the determination of the W mass? Well, okay, the point is that the determination of the W mass is done with a very, very high precision. And as you know, there have been claims that uh, it is uh, the, the, the latest uh, results are inconsistent with uh, the average and also with the standard model. And you need to really pin down these values to the point of a few uh, uh, dozens of MEVs. Now, if you get to this precision, if you want to get to this precision, then any non-perturbative part can be relevant, including the TMD part. So all these analyses have at some point some assumptions concerning TMDs because they use the uh, reconstruction of observable like uh, PT lepton or uh, MTW, which needs to know something about the initial transfer momentum of the quarks. And this initial transfer momentum of the quarks is taken from information about the Z boson. Mm -hmm. But if there is some flavor dependence, this game is spoiled because you don't have the same combinations for Zs as for Ws. One has to be careful about this. So we did try to see what could be the effect of this uh, change in the flavor uh, dependence. And uh, we ha at that time, we had to guess a few uh, reasonable values of uh, transfer momentum for different uh, core flavors, which gave uh, more or less the same description of Z. And see what happened on the determination of the W mass. And you see that. Uh, you have not uh, huge effects, but uh, few MEVs could definitely be uh, there. So this specific part can cause an error of the order of few MEVs on the determination of the W mass. And this has to be taken into account in our uh, opinion. Also, there is a connection with the determination of alpha S. This is really quite uh, uh, surprising or, uh, and, and, and new. Atlas uh, uh, published the recent determination of alpha S, the most precise uh, ever. And uh, among the contributions to the uncertainty in, in units of 10 to the minus three, so they are all very small, but still 
you see that there is part non perturbative model this is what we would attribute to the tmds and this estimate does not take into account the uh, up to date knowledge about tmds this could be in the, in the good or a bad way in the in the bad way in the sense that maybe it is an underestimate of these uncertainties in a good way in the sense that we have information about these non perturbative parts and so maybe in the end the impact is reduced okay so i'm running out of time already i ran out of time right now so uh, very quickly just flash some uh, results about the sievers tmd which is the only one we know sufficiently uh, well this has to do with the presence of polarization when there is polarization then there can be a distortion in kt and this distortion is related to the severe sanction here i just show you the fact that there are several or well, several a few extractions on the market uh, the most uh, recent ones are dating 20, 2020 21 and 22 and uh, they are uh, all uh, uh, qualitatively consistent in the sense that they all see a uh, large and positive uh, D sievers and a uh, large and negative uh, and an opposite sign U sievers. And uh, with this, you can also do these uh, nice pictures of the distribution of quarks, including their distortion if you have a polarization. Few recent uh, uh, works in this direction have been. Uh, this one by the gen collaboration where they this is an interesting approach because it puts together many observables and tries to do a global fit of several uh, tmds together so i consider this very nice under this respect but under other respects it is not at the same level of sophistication as the pure sievers extraction for instance it lacks information about the tmd evolution and it lacks information about the unpolarized uh, tmds and similarly, this uh, work is, was done using neural network, uh, a neural network approach in uh, uh, extracting the Sievers function. So again, this is interesting because it's the uh, example of the application of neural networks to TND, to the TND case, but again, it has some uh, uh, evident shortcomings compared to other extractions. Uh, the ESC will have uh, an enormous impact on uh, TMDs because it will cover this area which is presently uh, empty. They, no data, we are using no data in that region. And this gives you an idea of the impact. The uh, purple bands are the uh, MAP22 bands and the red bands are the ones we uh, would extract with using uh, uh, EIC pseudodata. So conclusions. Uh, the theory behind TMDs is in uh, good shape, uh, at least for quirks and at least uh, at uh, leading twist. Uh, um, progress is ongoing uh, concerning higher twist and glue on TMDs, and Christian will talk about glue on TMDs. Uh, the extractions of unpolarized TMDs uh, are reaching a good level, and uh, there are still open questions concerning uh, choices, uh, functional forms, uh, estimate of the uncertainties, flavor dependence, and so on. And for other TMDs, the study has barely started. Thank you. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. When you define this uh, TMD, uh, in the beginning, yeah. Is number nine. Yeah, I'll try to go back. You said it is uh, it's just a convolution of uh, non-perturbative collinear PDF times some calculable C is yes. collinear. Which yes, matching coefficients of uh, Sturman C is actually these collinear functions. They are calculable in perturbative QCD. Right. In power Correct. series in alpha S. Yes. And the coefficients are some impact parameter dependent. Yes. Is alpha S is a function. Yes. So if that is the case, if the PDFs are known from you know, extraction, extra, extra, you know, yes. using DIS or whatever. Yeah. And then you're just multiplying that uh, calculable functions. Yes. And what does it mean by um, extracting it again from experiments, actually? Because it's already it's just convoluting two functions. Uh, OK, yeah. I think I get your, your question. So no, so this part, 
from our side, we do not uh, uh, manipulate it, we do not change it. We take the collinear PDF at a certain, the things have to be done consistently. So if you want, let's say, N3 LL consistency from the TMD side, you should have N2 LO extractions of PDFs. Anyway, but so you have the extraction of the PDF. You have to have the matching coefficient at a certain order, in this case for N3 LL alpha squared. Okay, but once you do that, this, this is fixed. The thing we, we fit is this part and this part, which result from the fact that you, you uh, change the definition of the scale. So some part of this calculation cannot be done and has to be lumped into the non perturbative part. So we fit this and these uh, parts. In principle, however, the two things influence each other. So the TMD and the collinear PDF. So in principle, maybe in the future, maybe with EIC, it would be nice to do simultaneously the fit, both of the collinear and TMD. Thank you. So, Alessandro, very nice talk, very nice summary. But I'm correct to say that most of your extractions are still leading order. Uh, no, 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 I would not say so. What is um, an NLO of the... Uh, yeah, yeah good, uh, good, good question. So, for the, for the polarized ones, you're absolutely right, or one could say that we are not even there, because one has to know the evolution, let's say. But for the unpolarized TMDs, we are basically corresponding to N2 LO in the sense that we work, at least in our case, we work at what is important in the TMD case is the uh, logarithm uh, expansion. So we are at N3 uh, leading log in the TMD case. So N3 leading log means that we are using N2 LO uh, PDFs and alpha squared coefficient functions. So this is uh, comparable to N2 LO. Okay, good. Then we are a bit further. Nevertheless, all your uncertainties you show are surprising because, uh, especially if you look to flavor dependence and things like this, you have very few points. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really surprised that you get uncertainty bands like, uh, like this because even the unpolarized PDFs in some areas don't have set small uncertainty bands. So what goes into your uncertainty bands? Okay. And sometimes you don't show any. So, uh, which, yeah. We, we always show them, but okay. No, yes. uh, not you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, no, no. I don't mean Good you. point, good point. I mean so you globally. Yeah. So what goes into the determination of the uh, uncertainties are, as usual, the uncertainties on our uh, non perturbative parameters. So <laughs> in our case, we are, uh, uh, reconstructed bands using the Monte Carlo approach. So we have, let's say, 200 or 100 uh, sets of uh, parameter results, and this is what determines the band. So what changes are only in the, in the, in the uh, dark band are only the non perturbative parts of the TMDs. Now, uh, you may say that this is already surprisingly small, but uh, think, uh, take into account that we are using a what I consider a rigid functional form. Someone else would say that it's already too flexible, but from our point of view, is it, it is pretty rigid. So for sure, this is influenced by the rigidity of our functional form. So if you have a more flexible functional form, it might be that the uncertainty band increases. Of course. For instance, uh, take the flavor dependence. This particular result is, uh, uh, assumes same TMDs for all flavors which will not be the case in the final uh, situation. So we have all data, all of them contributing to fixing the single, this single uh, function. While if you have uh, differences in flavors, then some data sets will constrain more the up, some data set will concern, uh, constrain more the down and so on. So due to this, probably this band is even too small. But uh, apart from this, Look also the uh, red band. The red band is now including the, uh, the uncertainty on our non perturbative part, but also the uncertainty on the collinear PDF. So the uncertainty in the collinear PDF is yeah. fully taken into but account still in the don't, red band. It's a functional form on this. And uh, yeah, I, okay, I think they are all too small. 
yeah, it may be. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, generally speaking, I agree with you. Uh, page 19. 19. 19. 19, 1, 9. 19, yeah. Uh, yeah, this one is fine. Yes. Now, it looks like if you look at the, um, the zero KT date, um, the um, distribution does not seem to be monotonic, right? It is. Uh, <clears throat> The green one is the very small ones, and it go comes down and goes up, right? I mean, the um, the look at the zero zero k k curve. The zero k curve, right? Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so you mean the value, the intercept? Right. Right. Yes. So that means that it, it looks like. Do we have a plot of k k curve at uh, at the TMD? I don't have a, a, a I do not I do not have a plot like that. Some somewhat I don't know whether there is an explanation as to why. Yeah, there is an so explanation. Not monotonic. It goes down, right? So very small x is large. It goes down. Yeah. And it goes up. Okay. So and then eventually a uh, symmetric has to go let's down. Let's say right? there There's is. A a, yeah. The, the first uh, level explanation is that the integrals of these TMDs are fixed to be the collinear PDFs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Right. If at these values of uh, x, you have a certain value for the collinear PDF, yeah. the integral of this function will reproduce that, okay? Yeah. The integral. Uh -huh. But if one of the function is larger, yeah. then it will have a value of k uh, equals zero, a smaller value of equal zero at uh, k perp equal zero. Oh, I see, that's the integral. So for instance, the integral that, uh, k perp is equal yeah. to this one. So it's, you have to look at the integral. Okay. And the integral of this times k perp is actually the correct quantity to look at. So, yeah. I have a question. So, so, so the, the Colleen supper kernel that you use, to what, how large the perp do you need? And if someone gives you the Colleen supper kernel from other sources so that you don't have to fit it, how, how would that impact your studies? Okay, so. Uh, how large the value of BPERP uh, is difficult to say because uh, uh, these are convolutions. So we have data in KT space, not in BPERP, uh, in BT space. So basically the data in uh, KT space influenced uh, the BT uh, behavior all over the place. But uh, so I, I don't have a, a good, we, we should see if we modify the shape after a certain value of BT, what happens to the observables and maybe uh, not much will happen. And anyway, uh, that's my personal point of view. Even if you had a beautiful calculation from Lattice QCD, which gives us this behavior with very uh, small uncertainties, and even if all the Lattice QCD group agreed uh, on the result, I would still prefer to look at the phenomenology and see if they uh, agree or not. That's what we have to do first. Once we are sure that they agree, then okay, I believe uh, let us see also for other predictions. But if possible, whenever it's possible, we have to contrast the uh, calculations with the phenomenology. That's our task. I mean, I don't know, we, we, we could try. That's an exercise that we could try. Yeah, so could you please briefly comment on the status of extraction of other TMDs besides sievers and unpolarized? Uh, okay, so I gave you that list and I hoped it was uh, sufficient. So, uh, okay, so um, G1, the TMD dependence of G1 unknown. Transversity, uh, uh, many fits of transversity have uh, studied the, the X shape of transversity, but not so much the TMD shape of transversity. So I would say very uh, certain still. Uh, Boer Mulders, the problem is that uh, it is uh, combined with other uh, components in the observables, so it's difficult to disentangle them, but, uh, uh, and also needs uh, either to be combined with another Boer Mulders or with the Collins function. So it's a bit difficult, but okay, not impossible. So Boer Mulders uh, is something we can look for because it requires only unpolarized uh, uh, targets. And uh, uh, work gear, work gear G1T, 
I think it's a good, there, there's this uh, recent uh, work uh, which I mentioned, and uh, it's one of the easiest one because it, it is combined with the uh, unpolarized fragmentation function. Uh, the point is that we don't have much data. We need longitudinal beam and transverse polarized uh, target. And the other two, like uh, H1L perp and HD perp, are even more difficult. But uh, yeah, the, it, I think with uh, increasing amount of data with JLab, with DAC, there is hope to fix uh, them. At the moment, uh, the uncertainties are uh, very big. Okay, I think we have to continue. Um, yeah. Thank you.